Let's stand as we worship our King. change you never fail oh God true are your promises true are your promises you never change you never fail oh God and so we
sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home, with joy shall fill my heart then i shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art how great thou art how great thou art how great thou <laughs> That's right. She's learning early. Hey, uh, a couple announcements for us. We got some birthdays. Um, we have uh, Nina Foss and Tracy Topping. That's going to be their birthdays. That's right. And uh, Julie Held. So congratulate them and wish them a happy birthday. And uh, public service announcement. This is your seven-day warning that you're going to get an hour of sleep next week. So if you want to show up early and we got chores for you to do, it's, you can do that next Sunday. But it's time change, and so please set your clocks accordingly. And so if you're here early, um, yes, like we'll leave out a couple of mops and brooms and a vacuum. So to spare your time, if you want to give that extra hour to the Lord or to sleep, either one, resting. Remember, God rested too. So uh, please do that. Uh, so we got uh, that announcement and a couple uh, just other announcements. Thank you so much for everyone who donated um, candy because I can testify that we needed it <laughs> for the Harvest Festival. Oh, man, it was a blast. There were so many families coming out and uh, so many participated in that. So thank you for everyone who did that. It was really a wonderful event. Um, so many uh, were just here just enjoying uh, just being around each other. And uh, it was really fun for me giving sugar away to other kids rather than it being reciprocated. I was like, ha you're going to not have fun tonight. <laughs> so it was awesome. So again, thank you guys uh, so much for that. And then just a, a really quick update on uh, Little John. Uh, we announced that last week. Um, he is uh, doing better as of currently right now. He did get uh, pneumonia earlier on the week, but they were able to treat that. He is feeling his hands and feet um, better, and so continue to keep him up in prayer. And so he's, uh, as he goes through the recovery process. Um, again, thank you so much. His family is really blessed by that. I've been in contact with them. And so, again, um, we'll, do, we'll continue to be uh, partnering with them as the best way to help and, and support them in his road to recovery. And so, uh, that being said, we're going to continue to worship. Um, we're going to take this morning's tithes and offerings. So, would you play with, pray with me as we uh, do that this morning? Heavenly Father, again, we acknowledge um, as what Paul uh, gave us a wonderful picture of what um, your church is like. And he said, it's the body. Um, Lord, you've given, given us many different giftings. And Lord, but you also said when one part of the body is honored, all rejoice and celebrate. And when one part is um, just hurting, Lord, all uh, come around and gather around that person and individual. And so, Lord, we are thankful for that we get to celebrate, but also be in support, uh, Lord, for our family. And, Lord, we just ask as we take this offering, it is a participatory in worship to where we, you are entrusting us with your earthly resources. And so, Lord, we just ask that you touch these earthly resources and transform them into a way that they can be invested in your eternal kingdom. Lord, we know that this um, moth and rust can destroy our treasure, but, Lord, we know that when we invest in your kingdom, um, they can touch it. And so, Lord, we'd ask that you multiply it to meet the needs not only here in Corona, but also out through globe. And so, Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're continuing in the book of Colossians today. Um, we've got a couple more weeks in it, and then we're going to be uh, getting into a series on generosity. Um,
But today is, is one of those messages that uh, is a, what I call a mirror message for me, <laughs> because every word that I send out reflects back on me and what I need to pay attention, uh, pay attention to in my life. And um, it's one of those things where, uh, and I love it the way the Apostle Paul does it, because he, he's that, um, it's not sugar-coated, but every time he tells us something that we need to do in our lives, he says, but remember, Jesus is in charge and Jesus loves you. <laughs> and isn't that a good side? I like the fact that he puts that in there, because when we look at ourselves quite often in a mirror, we don't feel as though we measure up. And uh, today's chapter is one of those where it's going to make you think about where you stand and where you walk with Christ. So let's pray for God's presence, and then we'll get into it. Father, uh, we thank you for the way you are blessing this body. It was amazing to see 300 plus people out here uh, milling around in this small little parking lot, uh, enjoying one another, um, not wishing to go home at all, and enjoying not just the getting of candy, but the greeting and the hugging and the loving on each other. We thank you that you bless us with the ability to reach out to the community this way, and we thank you, Father, for everyone who went to an incredible effort to make it welcoming for those who came to partake of it. Uh, Father, we pray this morning for your word, that your word will impact lives as you have told us it can and will if we will only open our hearts to it. I pray you open hearts this morning, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray for change in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, I don't know how many of you have found yourself in the same problem situation that um, this guy has. Uh, he is uh, straddling in a no-win situation. <laughs> Yeah, uh, if you guys ever found yourself that way, where, where you, you're trying to, to accomplish something, some of you, oh, yeah, some of you just saw that, didn't you? Uh, it, it's, he's got a problem. We all have that problem at times. We want to juggle two different things. We, we want to keep one portion alive while getting over to the other portion, and um, none of us are immune to that, are we? No, none of us. And so um, what I want to talk about this morning is the Bible calls us to pick a side, the Bible says you've got to choose where you align, where you fall. Fall is a bad word when you're talking about this picture, but where you, not where you fall, but where you're going to land, um, where you're going to end up. And we're going to talk about three things as we do that. Uh, I'm going to read through the chapter. I'm going to put the three things up here so you can see it, and you'll hear them as I go through it. Taking off and putting on, transcending, and thankfulness. So let me read through Colossians chapter 3. If you have your Bible, you can turn to it. Colossians chapter 3. Verses 1 through 17. It says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. I'm going to read that one again. That's verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died in your life, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. By the way, the word hidden there doesn't mean away from you. It means kept. Your life is, uh, in fact, the Greek word there is crypt. You guys know what a crypt is. It's a place where you put something for keeping, um, preserving. Um, your life has been hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. Pretty straightforward, right? And in them you also once walked. <laughs> in other words, if you're looking at somebody else and you're pointing a finger that direction, remember there are three pointing back at you. Um, so it is not just a matter of it's where they are, it's where you also walked when you were living in those things. Verse 8, but now you also put them aside. And that's meant in an imperative voice. You also put them aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and have put on a new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man, but Christ is all and in all. So as those who have been chosen of God, those who have been chosen of God, I lost my place, there we go, uh, and, and beloved, put your heart, uh, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, 
so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Okay. You guys see the dichotomy, the two places, the two choices. We are told to take off and put on. I don't know how many of you remember when you were a teenager. Some of you still are there. Um, you remember when you were a teenager and you went into your room and you were trying to decide which piece of clothing you were going to put on. The determiner was which, are the clean, which is the clean pile and which is the dirty pile. <laughs> and because some clothes strafe from one pile to the other, you, you, you put them through a test, right? Yep, Cheryl just did it up here. You pick it up and, ah, uh, you no. Know, and then you go for the next one and decide, okay, putting on and taking off, I want you to keep that in mind when you do it. Those of you who have a household of boys, like the Castillos, you don't, there's, a, there's a barrier when you walk through the door. It's, it, it's that odiferous barrier where you can tell there are stinky socks, there are, I won't go any further. And you don't want to go any, you don't, you don't want to penetrate that, okay? Because there is no safe clothing in that room. What Jesus is telling us is he wants us to take off that which is soiled and put on that which is not. Okay, you guys catching that? Let's take a look at the first grouping where he talks about that. Let me first back up just a minute because there is a, um, a foundational principle upon which all this stands. Uh, it says, therefore, if you've been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above. We, uh, we stop doing that at a certain point in our lives. We figure we've reached the, the, the max, the top, the end, the whatever, and we stop moving forward. <laughs> My son was nice enough to me to let me know that when they had an Eagle Scout ceremony here, he says, yeah, there were Eagle Scouts from all different eras, and, and there were only two of them that got their Eagle Scout earlier than you did. <laughs> yeah, that's not making me feel very young. Uh, but what, what it is, we get to a certain age, we figure the achievement's done. We don't look to things yet to come. I have a 92-year-old mother who does wonder why the Lord has left her here. Um, she has us, but obviously we're not enough because she keeps making that statement. Um, but she, she's wondering why she's still here, and, and she knows God has to have a purpose for me. She is looking at 92, looking at what is that purpose God has for me yet still to fulfill. We're not done. We're never done. And we have to set our mind on things above. If we look down here, we've been promised perhaps three score and 10 years. That's what the Bible says. So if you do your math and you understand what a score is, that's 70. If you're over 70, you're in the plus column. Some of you are way in the plus column. And you're not done. Set your mind on the things above. Don't look at what's going around and figure, well, I've lived all I can. Where's my porch swing? Mm -mm. That is, a porch swings are not in the Bible. You guys know that, right? You're not allowed to sit on a porch swing, go la di da and just watch people go by. No. God has things for you to do. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things on this earth. Take off. Take off. Now, one of these, and for some of you, multiple of these, will apply to you. This has to do with where your emotions are and where they play themselves out in your lives. Take off. Remember, this is dirty clothing. You want to get rid of it. You don't want to put it on. Take off anger, wrath, malice, slander. As if those are not abusive speech, he throws in the words abusive speech. From your mouth. I don't know where else it's going to come, but from your mouth. Abusive speech. Get rid of it. Lying, evil practice. Do you see how much originates with this coming out through this because it goes right by this. And he's telling you, get those things off. Take them off. Can you tell somebody in school, kids, when you're in school, can you tell someone who did not pass the smell test when they were checking out their clothing that morning? You're sitting next to them in the classroom, and you go, it's not me. And you're wondering who it is. You can tell those who have not taken these things in life when you run into these people. Can you tell those who have not set aside anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from the mouth, lying, evil practice? Can you tell those? Yes. Because we are, at times, some of those ourselves. But he's telling us, do not, do not think you can live with one foot on the dock, one foot on the boat. You're going to have to make a choice. And put on, 
Put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, forbearance, forgiveness, love. Let's take a little deeper look at that. I love this, the way it says this in the, in the message. Uh, the message is a translation that is uh, more like a paraphrase translation, and it's great for getting um, some uh, nuances and understanding them as you're reading through God's Word. It's not a literal translation, but there's sometimes no better way to say it than the way the message says it. Ephesians echoes what we're talking about right here. It says, um, since then, we do not have the excuse of ignorance. Everything, and I do mean everything, connected with that old way of life has to go. It's rotten through and through. You get the picture? Does it remind you of that smelly t-shirt or pair of socks? Okay, it's rotten through and through. Get rid of it, and then take on the entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces his character in you. Doesn't that sound great? Isn't that awesome? That's what we should be focusing on. Compassion. Here's what it looks like in real life. Compassion. What does compassion mean? The word, I love the word in Greek, it's splachnoi. Splachnoi. You, you, and it actually means bowels, okay? It means that when you see something that stirs you to the point where you feel visceral up at you, whoa, that bugs me. It, I, can't, I can't sit still when that's going on. There's some reaction going on inside me. So we're supposed to have splachnoi. We're supposed to be responding when we see things going on in people's lives. Kindness, humility, and humility is not saying, well, I know I'm not really all that good. No, that's not what humility is. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's not thinking of yourself at all. It's putting God first and others in place. Gentleness, patience, forbearance, <laughs> All of you who have a younger brother or sister, forbearance. Yes, putting up with a little brother and sister. My, my little sister is uh, 66 years old. That's a lot of years of putting up, okay? And when she listens to this, I'm going to hear about it. But putting up, putting up, forbearance is what we're called to do. And we're going to get to the reason, the purpose behind all this as we get towards the end of this message. Forgiveness. And forgiveness isn't for the other person. Forgiveness is for you. You cannot harbor, hold on to, carry inside the burden of a wrong done to you and animosity towards the offender without it eating you up. So he's saying, these are earthly things. Get rid of these things. Forgiveness, then of course, love, he says he wants you to put on. Okay, let's go on. Transcending. So we're supposed to put these things on, take the other things off, and then we're supposed to transcend, and let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, transcend means, by the, the, the Western's definition, to look or go beyond the range or limits of something. So when someone says that they have transcended um, in their thoughts, it means they've gone past the, the, the elementary things and they've, they've gone beyond into things that are a little bit deeper. I want to use it in a way that demonstrates what God's trying to say through his word here. It says, and you have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal, which means we have to get past all the stuff that's in front of us. It's not easy to get past what you see, is it? When you see something moving to a place where it, has, it fits within the frame of reference, it has understanding, you have comprehension of it, but getting past it isn't always easy. You, you see someone who is suffering, we're not supposed to get past the feeling but we're supposed to look beyond it to what we're gonna do in reaction to what we're seeing. That's transcending. A renewal in which there is no distinction. Okay, now this gets into what's floating around right now in the schools and every place else. There is no distinction. It does not exist is the way the actual translation, is, translation says. There is no existence of these things between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man, but Christ is all and in all. And let me tell you what basis he's covering here. He's covering the Jews who thought they were high and mighty, the Greeks who the Jews called dogs. That's a dichotomy. That's two polar extremes. He's getting to them saying there is no difference. How do you think that made a Jew feel? <laughs> you mean I'm the same as them in Christ? But, but, but look at them. God, we are your people. Look at them. How can we be the same as them in your eyes? They're dogs. They're not even fit to eat table scraps, it says in one portion of the Bible. Whoa. Now, how to make the Greek feel? 
<laughs> you Jews, you thought you were something, didn't you? He's drawing two different extremes and bringing them together and saying, in me, I don't see any difference. Human being, human being, human being, human being. And he says, circumcised, uncircumcised. I don't care what procedure, ceremony, what you've done in your processing to make you think you are different than you were. Makes no difference. Barbarian and Scythian. Now, a lot of people don't understand what he really means by that. Barbarians were those who were not Jews or Greeks. <laughs> That's the rest of the world. From where some of you came from? Barbarian. Yep, some of you. Some of you were even Scythians, with me, which means you were not just a barbarian. You were the worst of the barbarians. So it's not just barbarians, but it's the baddest barbarians also. Slave and free, those speak for themselves. But in Christ is all and in all. When God looks at us, we have varying heights, varying weights, varying ages, varying genders sitting in this room. Do you know he does not see the distinction? He sees the individuality he created you with, but he doesn't see the distinction. There's no disparity in the value of one over the other. So this junk that's floating around that says some is better than others is just that junk. And if that's going through your household because it's coming through some school, you need direct, to direct your children to understand how God sees humankind all the same. Regardless of what they've been through, regardless of where they come from, there is no distinction. Galatians says it this way, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. Okay, that sounds familiar. We just went over that. And then he goes to, there is neither male nor female. Yeah. <laughs> Because we, we want to, we tend to, we like to believe that these distinctions matter. Well, in some frame of reference, they do, but not to God. There is no difference. All one in Christ Jesus. <sighs> Transcending can be accomplished in a couple of pseudo ways. By pseudo, I mean false ways, and then one real way. Here's one of the false ways. You guys, I don't know, some of you don't watch movies, some of you do. There's an older movie, uh, I think it came out in the 80s or 90s, called Shallow Hell. It's a guy who um, is uh, having difficulty with relationships, and he gets hypnotized. And because of the hypnosis, he sees things different than they are in reality. So he has to mask reality for him to see things. You guys get where I'm going. Shallow Hell says, uh, in fact, in one, one scene, he introduces his girlfriend who is Gwyneth Paltrow uh, in here, who is not 300 pounds, but in the bodysuit she's wearing in that movie, she's 300 pounds. And he introduces her to his friend, and his friend just starts cackling and laughing like, oh, you're kidding me, really? And then he makes all sorts of disparaging comments about her and her weight to him, and he starts to become offended because he's been hypnotized not to see it. That isn't God's way. We're not supposed to ignore what's in front of us. Shallow hell teaches the way for you to be able to get along with those who are less than desirable to society is for you to be fooled into thinking they're different than they are. No. Someone who is in a category that the world casts out, God wants you to see them as real. Don't mask it. Don't hide it like shallow hell. The other one is, is the movie Hitch. Now, Hitch is, is a guy who is a... Um, a relationship counselor. And for those of you who've seen the movie, you know exactly where I'm going. He teaches people how to behave differently so they can enhance their relationships. He, he teaches them that, oh, no, 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 no. And he's teaching a guy named Albert. Albert, don't do that. Whatever you do when you're in front of a girl, don't do that. Um, he has that kind of commentary that he adds to the instruction he's providing for Albert. And, and, and the, towards the end of the movie, the beautiful woman that has fallen in love with Albert starts to wonder, has she fallen in love with all these schemes that he's been putting up, putting up to, put up to, or was that really him? And then she starts to list the things. And the things like using an inhaler in front of me, doing this, doing that, spilling mustard down so I wouldn't feel so bad when I spill mustard down the front of my blouse, that kind of stuff. And then Hitch tr starts to tell her, I d he didn't do that. He really didn't do that in front of you, did he? The point is, I taught him to behave a certain way to counter who he really is so that he could win you over. And ultimately in the story, he realizes, I did nothing. He just showed you his true self and you fell in love with his true self. Okay, 
it isn't God's way for us to deceive others by behaving a certain way so that we or they feel accepted. So it isn't a matter of hypnotizing us so we don't see them. It isn't a matter of us changing ourselves so that we are more accommodating to where they are. No, that isn't God's way. God's way goes beyond that. And I want to liken it to this. Now, this, I'm not saying that God likes football over any other sport. <laughs> let, let me read what it says here, and then I'm going to show you a clip. Uh, in, in 1971, some of us were around then. In 1971, during the, the end of the hippie era, there were two brothers from Berkeley. Actually, that's their byline on this book, written by two brothers from Berkeley. It's called Letters to Street Christians, and it told things how it was. It used words like groovy and cool and all sorts of stuff in the translation. It's, it's really sort of funky. In fact, I told um, uh, Timmy that uh, I looked it up on Amazon. The book now retails, or someone thinks it's worth, over a thousand bucks. Yeah, really. So those of you who thought we were really off base when we were talking that way in the 70s, uh-uh, we know what we were doing. We're worth a thousand bucks now. Uh, no, but, th but this book, this book, uh, was to a crowd that thought the established church was never anything that they could identify with. This book was written, and it is the epistles of Paul written in common English for that day. Listen to the way it says our new life, our different life is supposed to be. In our new life, there is no difference between people at racial levels, at political levels, or any other level because Jesus is all that matters and he lives in all the brothers and sisters. Don't you like the way they say that? They're on any, and isn't that apropos? That's written 50, 50 years ago, and it says at the racial level, at the political, political level, there is no difference between any of us because with Jesus, we're all brothers and sisters. Okay, when you transcend what the world wants to put in front of you, it doesn't mean you ignore it. It doesn't mean you change yourself to accommodate it. It means you see it full strength headed towards you, just like a quarterback. Watch this clip and you'll see exactly what I mean. Well, they get it off. They need the 27 for a first. Penalties fly. Rodgers dancing. Fires downfield for Adams. He's got it. Touchdown. Rodgers just made. It was all for not. The arm strength to flip the ball. For Aaron Rodgers. Glover Quinn's going to get hypnotized right in the middle of the field. I think that's him. He sees the play fake. Gets fooled. Crabtree runs right by him. What a great play call by Mike McCarthy. Third and short. <laughs> Pretended to block for just a second. And Glover Quinn got burned. Boom! Give Rodgers credit. He took a big shot. Okay. What a quarterback has to do when they are focused on getting the ball into the arms of the receiver downfield is they have to transcend the reality in front of them. Do they ignore it? I can promise you, Aaron Rodgers did not ignore two 300-pounders coming after him. You don't ignore them. You know they're coming. In fact, you brace yourself knowing they're coming after you. But do you lose sight of what you're doing? The reason I show these two clips, in both of them, he gets hit. But does he lose focus on what he's called to do? No. Okay, that is God's way of dealing with this world and the differences that exist. That is God's way of putting into focus the things we're supposed to put on and get rid of. Because when we put on all of those things in that list that he gave us, we will be able to focus on the goal and not be distracted by the stuff that's right in front of us. In the same way that a quarterback has to do that every single time. Okay, let's get to thankfulness. Thankfulness is a Holy Spirit manifestation. Let me say that again so you understand what I mean. Thankfulness is something you can't do on your own. You can be gracious, but you can't be what God is calling us to do without inside your heart the Holy Spirit giving you the ability to be thankful in situations that the world would look at and go, he's thankful for what just happened? That would be like Aaron Rodgers going, yeah, I love that 300 pounder the way he knocked me off my socks. Thankful means you take an interpretation that not only allows you to transcend what's coming after you, but it gives you the ability to be thankful what you've been through because God's in the middle of it. And it's not about you anyway. It's about the, in this case, Christ's team. Let the word of Christ richly dwell, richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. 
Not one person doing it to everybody. One another. With psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with thankfulness. Okay, what's singing with thankfulness? Uh, if I asked you, you guys know what a cacophony is? A cacophony is sounds that when emanated don't necessarily fit with each other. That would be harmony. Cacophony is when there's just sound. If I asked you all to sing out a note, pick a note. What we would end up in this room with, even though some of you can sing very melodically, we would end up with a cacophony. Because none of you have gotten together with the other one going, let's take a B flat. No, you all are going to sing the note that's in your head. You're going to create a cacophony. Singing to God is a cacophony of our hearts. And that brings joy to him when we do it with thankfulness. When it's motivated by, I don't care what I've been through, God, whatever you have taken me through, I am going to sing at the top of my lungs. And I love watching someone sing at the top of their lungs who can't carry a tune in a basket. I love that because they're all into it and they're just going at it and, oh my gosh, they're just ooh, emanating joy. Isn't it cool to watch? You don't want to get too close, but it's cool to watch. <laughs> Singing with thankfulness in your heart to God. So it's not... I'm focused on the voice, so the voice is where I'm going to pay my attention, and if the voice is off, whoop, I'm turning off. No. What does it say? In your hearts to God. Then whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Okay. If we, put, if we take off and put on what we're supposed to, if we transcend all the things that this world throws at us and we keep our eye on the goal, if we have an attitude of thankfulness within our hearts towards anything we have run into, what does that set us up for? What does that prepare us for? I don't know if any of you had an opportunity to, to travel to um, Paris. Janice and I spent three weeks there for one of our anniversaries. I know I should remember which one, but, um, <laughs> but it, was, it was a fun th three weeks. And one of the places we went to the, was the uh, Notre Dame uh, Cathedral which was awesome. This is long before the fire that occurred within the last year or so. Um, a, a majestic building. Victor Hugo, in 1831, wrote a novel called The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And for many of you, it, it, may, it may be the Disney version that you're familiar with, okay, which is the cartoon, but the story is still basically the same. There is a um, less than fortunate individual who has a physical deformity. He is the hunchback. There is a gypsy that is a character. Her name is Esmeralda. The gypsies feel like outcasts. Obviously, Quasimodo feels like an outcast. In fact, he is crowned in the beginning of the book the Pope of Fools because they're actually making fun of him, setting him up, um, and standing him out in front of everybody for the purpose of calling him a fool in public. Esmeralda comes from gypsies, and gypsies, you got to know, in the established European community, were outcasts. They were wandering people. The Roma people still exist, and they are very, very much alive and well, and they have a culture unto themselves. We think of gypsies as those who just wander, and in this day, they did. They didn't have a homeland of their own. They occupied other spaces, and they were thought to be um, thieves, all sorts. They were outcasts. They were outcasts. There's a scene um, in the book, and it's played out in the Disney version, where uh, Esmeralda is going into the chapel to pray because her heart is heavy. She is feeling as though no one gets her. No one understands her. And certainly she has met Quasimodo. No one understands him. Now, as she goes into the cathedral, I want you to catch the, the, what's going on. There's all these Gregorian chant priests and everything walking back and forth through it. And they're singing their songs and their chants, and she walks in to utter a prayer. And she gets in front of a statue, and Jesus is there, and she starts to sing this song. Let me read this song to you, and I want you to listen to it carefully. When I said a minute ago, or asked the question a minute ago, what does this prepare us for? The world is full of outcasts. The world is full of people that want to know there is a difference. There are people in this world who are different than those who don't even consider me being alive. There are people in this world who feel they don't even know why they were born should they remain. And there are people in this world who are the brunt of everybody's jokes and sometimes abusive behavior. 
in our country right now, we have people rebelling because they feel their people have been put into a place where they have been the brunt of that for a long time. If this had been adopted 200 years ago, we wouldn't be where we are right now. And if we adopt it right now, we won't stay where we are. Let me read you what Esmeralda's song said. She's in the, in the cathedral, and she starts to sing. It's a beautiful song, by the way. It says, I don't know if you can hear me or if you're even there. I don't know if you will listen to a humble prayer. They tell me I'm just an outcast. I shouldn't speak to you. Still, I see your face, and I wonder, were you once an outcast too? God help the outcasts, hungry from birth. Show them the mercy they don't find on earth. The lost and forgotten, they look to you still. God help the outcasts, or nobody will. I ask for nothing. And as she's singing, I ask for nothing. The priests in the, uh, are, are walking by saying, we pray for wealth, we pray for power, we pray for our name to be above all names. That's the contrast that's going up. The dichotomy, the contrast between the world and a heart that's speaking, reaching out to God. I ask for nothing, I can get by. But I know so many less lucky than I. God help the outcast, the poor and downtrod. I thought we all were the children of God. I don't know if there's a reason why some are blessed, some not. Why the few you seem to favor, they fear us, flee us, try not to see us. God help the outcast, the tattered, the torn, seeking an answer to why they were born. Winds of misfortune have blown them about. You made the outcasts. Don't cast them out. The poor and unlucky, the weak and the odd. I thought we all were the children of God. We all are the children of God. And so is every single individual outside those doors. You want to know why we should take off that old and put on the new? You want to know why we should transcend? You want to know why our hearts should be full of thankfulness? Because they need to see that. Not as a matter of show, as a matter of heart. Only you know where you stand in that. Let's pray. Father, my heart is heavy for those who are maybe even in this room, but for those who certainly I know exist outside these walls, who don't know you, don't know if you're real. They see themselves as an outcast, but in your eyes they're not. I pray, Father, that we adopt them in our eyes the same as you see them. That they're no longer seen as that which is only fit for being the brunt of jokes and be making, making a fool of. I pray, Father, for the blessing of being able to be brought face to face with those people, keeping our eyes on the goal of reflecting you and letting them know there is a place for them. And this I pray in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, you guys are good. Uh, as we come and take uh, part in communion, um, one of the uh, themes that Pastor Mike just shared is the taking on and putting off. And uh, when that list came on of the stuff that we're supposed to take off, I don't know if that convicted any of you like it did for me. I was like, oh, that one's me. Yep, that one's me. That one's me. And uh, we're reminded of communion of going, yeah, that's what Jesus went to the cross for. That's why he wants us to be a new person. Some of the things that we look at our neighbor, we need to get new lenses and see him as an image bearer, as what Pike, Mike was sharing. And so just take a few moments as we prepare for the bread and look at the things that we need to take off. It says, on the night in which Jesus betrayed, he broke the bread and he took it and he gave thanks. So take and eat. And the story continues to go on. Mike mentioned there was a visceral response of that word compassion. And when Jesus looked out into the crowd, he said, he looked at people and he says, they're like a sheep without a shepherd, and he had compassion on them. 
And that's how he looks at us. He looked at us as we needed help. We needed someone to come alongside us, to lead us, to show us that there's a way to live life the way we've always intended to live life. And this is what the cup symbolizes, that we're made anew, that all the stuff that we had missed the mark with, but we're made anew. So take a few moments to reflect upon being new this morning. And Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. Do this as often as you remember. Drink. Let me pray a blessing as we continue to worship. Heavenly Father, again, we recognize that it's through your son's death, burial, and resurrection that gives us access into your presence. And Lord, we're thankful for what the gospel tells us that you became flesh to dwelt among us, that you came for those who were sick, that you had compassion on those. And Lord, you intended us to live life to where we can genuinely love our neighbor as ourselves. And so help us do that through your spirit. And Lord, we just ask you continue to lead us and guide us as we want to accurately reflect your love that you have for our neighbors. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us continue to worship. Let us stand and sing.
done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for everything that you've done for us. Thank you for everyone here that's here to worship you today. And thank you that you're healing little John and he's doing better than he was before. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> 